Great. Um, thank you all for coming. Above all, thank you, Guy, for coming this evening, and colleagues from the ILO office. They were caught up in traffic getting down here. Um, I think you know all about Guy Ryder from the announcement, but a few things that attracted my attention. Um, uh, he studied at Cambridge in political science, but then uh, in his hometown, Liverpool, uh, a fantastic town, by the way, that's well worth visiting. I did last year for the first time. Um, uh, he studied, he specialized in Latin American studies. And very rapidly, and I'm going to be asking you about this, you got into the international dimension of trade, uh, trade union work. So international federations of trade unions, the ILO, which is a tripartite organization, as you know, with uh, governments, employers, uh, uh, trade unions, and um, uh, worked at the ILO uh, for a number of years, left to become head of the International Federation of Trade Unions, but came back uh, and was soon thereafter uh, elected uh, Director General of uh, ILO. Um, now, Guy, I wanted to ask you, because you grew up in Britain and your political consciousness may have been shaped by events that shaped even mine in distant Canada, which was the huge clash between the British government and the miners and their trade union in Britain. It was a defining moment for British society. And I wanted to ask you whether it was that that got you interested in, in the trade union world or what it was. Well, the great miners' strike of 1984-1985 was actually working for the trade unions at that time. Uh, mm. So it happened earlier on, but I mean, I don't want to bore you with my life story. Mm. Uh, do come and visit Liverpool, though, if I can say <laughs> that. I, I, I take advantage to say that. Look, I grew up, I was born in Liverpool, grew up in the industrial northwest of the UK. I'm not sure what the US equivalent would be, but it would be a sort of a Rust Belt sort of... Uh, sort of declining Pittsburgh. industrial Pittsburgh, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I grew up in the late 70s there. Um, it was an area, a region in industrial decline, which hadn't realized it yet. Now, we still thought that the future was in textiles, was in metal, was in all of the traditional industries, mm -hmm. in what was the cradle of the Industrial Revolution. And very quickly, we were disabused of all of that. Um, I joined uh, the, I became a, a trade union official if my memory serves me correct, in, in 82. That was three years into Margaret Thatcher's first uh, prime ministership. Uh, it was a moment when uh, the British labor movement, which at its height uh, numbered 13 million members, it's today around 6 million, uh, that, mm. that's the difference, began to feel the full offensive of, of what I guess you would today call the neoliberal offensive, which was felt in, uh, uh, felt in, in the UK and frankly, pretty quickly here in the United States. The miners' strike to the UK was what PATCO was to the US labor movement. I would, I would, hazard, the, uh, I would hazard the parallel. And the 1984-85 miners' strike, to anybody who lived through it, was, was quite dramatic. Quite dramatic, because it was a head-on collision between the most powerful organized labor body in, in the United Kingdom. We had 100,000 organized miners at that point. We've now, the miners now fit into a phone box, is what we say in the UK. Uh, uh, so 100,000 miners in some of the most, um, how can I put it, not marginalized, but some of the toughest industrial regions of the country. And it was 18 months of straightforward confrontation, a great deal of violence, and a massive amount of deprivation. And however people want to see it in retrospect, it was a massive defeat for organized labor. Uh, they handled it, uh, and uh, you know, I'll say it from the distance of history, uh, a massively badly organized strike with no strategic outcome in mind, with highly political motivation, and it led to the destruction of an industry, a destruction of a, uh, a national trade union, and it hastened, accelerated, I think, uh, the decline of organized labor in the UK at that time, after which it had to regroup and reorganize. 
Not something you easily forget, by the way. And it led me, if I'm trying to sort of lead on to something more, uh, more intellectual in this conversation, uh, it, it left me with the impression that head-on confrontation between organized labor and capital, at least in this one instance, wasn't always the best way to do things. This wasn't a, an ideological consideration, it was a practical consideration. Uh, it just did not work. It did not work, and I did not see uh, in my own union situation any particular future or interest in that sort of straight-on confrontational um, uh, uh, way of doing things because the likely outcome was that uh, labor would come off worse. Uh, and that's what's happened in the UK. Now, for my own personal development, that led me into this belief that actually, you know, trying to find ways of doing industrial relations which did not imply a zero-sum game, that there is the potential for, for I'm sorry about the cliche, win-win situations of, of cooperation between the two sides of industry, and with a role for the state as well, that seemed to me like a sensible thing. And, you know, without simplifying matters too much, the ILO sort of exemplifies that way of doing things. The notion that, you know, there are ways for government to sit down with employers and workers' representatives and work out agreed positions which move you forward, which move everybody forward. Now, that's not a universally accepted proposition, but it's a proposition upon which the International Labour Organization was predicated uh, and, and which it continues 100 years later to, um, to, to prosecute. Quite interesting, if you go right back to the beginnings of the ILO, and I don't want to give you a history lesson, but formed in 1919, Woodrow Wilson was perhaps the main architect, Samuel Gompers, Lloyd George, Clemenceau, you know, a lot of big people there. But when the ILO actually got up and running, the United States wasn't there. You went into one of your bouts of uh, periodic isolationism. Uh, Woodrow Wilson couldn't get the treaty through the Senate. The Soviet Union absolutely despised the ILO, precisely because of this notion that there was not an inevitable conflict of class interest. So the Soviet Union poured scorn on the ILO until it eventually crept into the ILO, uh, as did the United States, uh, around the 30s and 40s. Um, so that's basically how I found a way into the ILO and why, frankly, the ILO made some sort of sense to me. Mm. I know there are alternative views, that this is not the way uh, that interests are advanced at work, but it's my view of how things should be done. Great. Now, when you came to the ILO, my experience of international organizations, and Philip has at least as much as I do in the back of the room, Philip Alston, um, is that they have ups and downs. And the ILO has had ups and downs, at least to me as, as an observer of international organizations. And what was striking to me was that we started work at the UN at roughly the same time. Very soon after you became Director General, there was a feeling that the organization was refocusing, not so much on labor relations as such, but on work and the importance of work. And this is something that has had tremendous appeal, I find. When I talk about UN organizations, I talk about ILO, I always switch to talking about its focus on work, and people wake up, actually. So I wanted to ask you what led you to this uh, um, sort of shift in the emphasis at ILO. Well, to go back to the beginning of your question, yes, the ILO has had its ups and downs over 100 years. We've had near-death experiences uh, on several occasions. Uh, the first would be when the League of Nations crashed, you know, in, in the 1930s leading up to, to World War II. Uh, the ILO survived by a sort of an adventure story miracle. Uh, you know, we packed the office up, put it on a boat, went down to Lisbon, uh, sorry, drove down to Lisbon, got the boat and did exile of the Second World War at McGill University in Montreal. The United States didn't want us at that point, uh, so we went up, to, up across the border to Canada. That was one near-death experience. The second near-death experience was not an unpleasant experience, but when the UN came into being, I think there were thoughts about whether the ILO needed to be reworked or become something different from what it originally was. But the third near-death experience was actually, um, well, it was really the end of the Cold War. Yeah. It was really the end of the Cold War, where basically we all remember the end of history sort of idea. You know, many people still saw the ILO as a protagonist, and, and that was its basic interest in the Cold War. You know, this was about taking on 
the Eastern Bloc uh, conception of labor and how labor uh, relates to the state. Um, so once all of that was over, a lot of people, particularly on the employer's side of our house, said, well, what's the point of the ILO any longer? So we had to make a case for the ILO in the era of globalization that was then unfolding. And that was something very new for us, and it's not entirely comfortable for the organization. But recently, and I've been in the job now for about six or seven years, it struck me, we're in a period when I think many people feel the world of work is undergoing transformative change. And this sounds, again, somewhat cliche-ridden, but, you know, with technology doing to the world of work what it is doing, uh, with issues of climate change, issues of demography, demography, excuse me, there is a feeling that we have not simply to remain within the classic um, parameters and concepts of industrial relations as perhaps Professor Alvarez, you've taught it at university and I grew up in. We have to have to look at the nature of work and the meaning of work in society because it's quite possible uh, that work will be performed in ways which do not properly or easily fit in to the established concepts of labor and the institutions of labor that we, and the ILO has been instrumental in this, have created over a century. Uh, being somewhat jet-lagged, I turned on the television very early this morning and saw a Democratic Party presidential contender basically wheeling out uh, the end of work scenario as a, 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 as a reason for, for, for promoting universal basic income as a good policy plank. I really worry about that. By the way, it, it is relevant to your question about why we're talking about work. It is because such fundamental questions are now being asked about how work is to be organized. Not just the quantity of employment available, but what the organization of work will be and how the social provisions we've made and the institutions we have developed will or will not be apposite to the new world of work that's being created. And there's a bit of a chicken, a chicken and egg in all of this, because basically I do think that the institutions we have properly adapted can shape the world of work that we want. And they don't have to be the passive variable in change at work. But there is an interesting dialectic going on here between the way the world of work is moving and the capacity of our institutions to shape it in the direction that we want it to go. So yes, we talk more about, and it's the key issue of the ILO centenary, the future of work, and properly so. But I wouldn't like you to run away with the conclusion that that means we're discarding or leaving behind us our proper responsibilities of industrial uh, relations, because I think the two are not mutually exclusive. I think we're, we're looking at how the two things fit together and interact. Great. is to let you interact with students and others in the audience and uh, so we'll, we'll keep our questions relatively short um, but Professor Alvarez has actually worked on the ILO quite a bit so uh, over to you Jose. So, um, so just so that you know your audience it's uh, students in international law uh, first year students, as well as students of our course, David and I course on international organizations. And this is the week that we're gonna be turning to the ILO. One of the things you, I think you alluded to is a new initiative on decent work. And I'm curious how you define decent work and does it relate to human rights? In other words, are labor rights uh, human rights and how does it relate to decent work? The decent work agenda, so-called, was the uh, creation of my predecessor. Um, I think it's a very important development uh, in the, uh, the work of the organization. And it's left, actually, a very strong footprint, I think, a very strong mark in the way that uh, work issues are, are dealt with around the world. Uh, I go to a lot of countries where, you know, either in trade union um, uh, revindications or in state policy, the notion of promotion of decent work is omnipresent. If you look at the UN 2030 agenda, look at um, uh, goal number eight, there it is, decent work for all. So it's an innovation which has really, I think, um, found, its, found its place. But what does it mean? I think that's the question. Well, decent work is, a, in a sense, a way of, of expressing extremely succinctly what have for some time been uh, the key strategic objectives of our organization, and they are four. The first, and it relates very strongly to your question, Professor, uh, is about what the ILO calls fundamental rights at work. Uh, and those are, have been recognized as such 
at least since 1998, and there's a controversy there that I know about, the right to organize, uh, the right to collective bargaining, the right to protection from child labor, from forced labor, and from discrimination. And that includes the notion of equal pay for work of equal value, which I would remind everybody has been in the ILO Constitution since 1919. So that's the first pillar of the decent work agenda, the notion of fundamental rights at work and international labor standards in a more generic sense. The, uh, the second uh, pillar is the employment pillar, the notion that full employment, decent work for all, is a very important objective. The ILO at no point has uh, let go of uh, the notion of full employment as a key objective of public policy, and I think that might sound self-evident to you, but there were times when the, you know, the neoliberal agenda was finding its feet uh, in Europe and North America, and it was very clear that the post-war commitment to full employment had fallen down the policy agenda. The ILO never let that go. So the notion of a decent work for all, so it means an opportunity for employment, but it also implies an income uh, which is sufficient uh, to provide for a decent standard of living. Again, reverting to the ILO's founding constitution. Please read the preamble to the constitution. I guess that's the first thing you do. It's 860 odd words. I counted them the other day. 860 words. An adequate minimum living wage is there. An adequate living wage is there from 1919. So the decent work agenda implies an opportunity to work but a decent income coming from it. The third pillar of the decent work agenda is about social protection. Again, it goes back to the origins of the ILO. Uh, the notion uh, that um, uh, least minimum levels of social protection should accompany employment in all cases. And that's also a big issue today. And the fourth pillar, I'm sorry I'm being very telegraphic in all of this, but it goes back to what I said in my initial comments. It's about the manner in which interest is re represented at work and conflict is resolved. And here, and it's axiomatic to the way the ILO does its work, it's about social dialogue. It's about dialogue that conflict is resolved through dialogue and agreement and consensus rather than imposition. I've often been told that social dialogue does not translate into American, uh, into American language. Maybe it doesn't today, but I'll be going to Hyde Park to the Roosevelt Library next week, and there's some remarkable stuff, and I've been reading up on the New Deal and Roosevelt. It was a big deal in the New Deal, so never tell me it's social dialogue. Uh, doesn't translate into American. It may translate less easily into modern, contemporary American, but it's been part of the development of uh, labor arrangements in the United States. So those are the four pieces of the uh, Decent Work uh, Agenda. So you alluded to controversies uh, associated with, with this, so I'll, uh, and perhaps you were thinking of two. One is uh, articles like this from Philip Alston, I'm sure you're familiar with, that the 1998 declaration, which elevated some ILO conventions over others, softened labor law, turned it into principles, softened the enforcement, uh, and was overall a bad thing. That was one criticism. And then there's the other criticism that I think the ILO is still wrestling with, which is whether the, the right to organize convention includes the right to strike. Uh, this was a long-standing principle of the organization, that it, the right to strike is embedded in uh, the, the, the ILO itself, as well as in the freedom uh, to organize. Uh, and yet, the employers group in 2012 uh, said that the supervisory committees that have uh, promoted that interpretation uh, went too far. And as I understand it, that, that particular problem hasn't been resolved. So. Can you say something about those two controversies, Philip Alston and others, uh, softening of labor law, turning into something that can't be enforced by law and maybe lawyers shouldn't be involved, uh, plus the right to strike? Yeah, I am familiar with both of those controversies, all too familiar. Um, and I come to both controversies unburdened with any expertise in law, so um, I, I don't know if this is going to help or hinder the conversation. I was very much involved in the negotiation of the 1998 uh, declaration. At that time I was secretary of the workers group that negotiated the declaration. So declaring an interest I do not subscribe. Uh, I did not at the time and I do not today subscribe uh, to the notion, uh, and you've set out the arguments very, very succinctly, that the declaration was a bad thing 
either because it established a hierarchy, which it did, I think it's fair to say that it did, or that it led to a softening of, of, of labor law in a sense of established uh, principles rather than the absolute, you know, the hard edge side of a legally adjudicable uh, convention. On the hierarchy, please think of the context. This may not be evident to, to, to everybody. This declaration was negotiated and adopted in 1998. That was at a time just after when it came on the heels of a major international debate about trade and labor standards with the creation of the World Trade Organization in the mid 1990s. We, uh, the international labor movement, went to the WTO conference in Singapore in, I believe, 1995, arguing the case that uh, labor standards needed to be included in one way or another in the trading arrangements and the Treaty of the World Trade Organization. We made the case for a social clause. This was a level playing field uh, writ large. That is to say that if you want an open trading regime and if you want to ensure that that open trading regime helps to promote good labor practices and shared prosperity rather than benefit from the possibility that good labor standards be undercut, you needed to make some sort of linkage between trade and labor standards. It was therefore incumbent in, in that project um, for the labor movement to say, well, what labor standards are you talking about? Are you talking about absolutely everything you can imagine? And at that time, and it relates to the initial question, uh, the labor movement said, no, there are a number of labor issues, labor standards, which constitute fundamental rights, and this package are those fundamental rights which I just mentioned to you earlier on, organizing collective bargaining discrimination forced labor and child labor. The argument being these things needed to be taken out of international trade competition. So we made the case with that package of conventions. Uh, it didn't happen. Uh, in Singapore, uh, the decision taken, mostly because the developing world smelled uh, protectionism in all of this, uh, the, the Singapore conference said, okay, uh, the WTO does trade, the ILO does labor standards. Get on with it. Uh, and please don't talk to each other very much. And we did not talk to each other very much. But that left the problem unresolved of how to try to establish in some manner or another the level playing field. And this was a genesis of the declaration. That is to say, establishing a declaration, which I'm sure you'll be looking at, I think says very clearly that by virtue of membership of the ILO, there are certain responsibilities in these areas that any member, regardless of whether it's ratified the conventions concerned had an obligation uh, to, to fulfill. The objections, number one, does it make sense to establish a hierarchy of this nature? I argue yes. I don't see the downside to it. I don't see the downside to it. Uh, it is enormously helpful, and you know, I make no apology for saying this. I find a ratification of an ILO convention of this fundamental category to be enormously important. They are, in a sense, enabling conventions. If these are respected, a lot else becomes possible. And the good news is, since the adoption of this declaration, the rate of ratification of these fundamental conventions, contrary to the worries of some people, has gone up. It actually provoked the ratification of conventions, not a fall off in the ratification of them. So I don't think we've done damage in that regard. The other, and it's a very much a legal discussion, that, well, this actually weakens the, um, uh, you know, the, it weakens the nature of labor law by establishing a notion of principles, which are not legally you know, a binding uh, conventions once ratified. Okay, I mean, that, I'm not a lawyer, I repeat. Uh, let's say I can, I, 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 can see, I can see that argument. I'm a practitioner. I'm a practitioner. I, I, I went about this declaration with very clear objectives in mind. There isn't a shadow of doubt in my mind that whilst we haven't achieved all of the, of the objectives we want for labor, the existence of the declaration has very, very considerably strengthened our hand in actually moving forward in protecting workers. You know, the WTO, you know, excluded itself from having anything to say about labor standards in trading arrangements. Today, about 70, 75%, I have to look at our most recent research, of trade agreements, which are negotiated outside the WTO, because 
not a hell of a lot's getting negotiated inside the WTO these <laughs> days, uh, either bilaterally, sub-regionally, plurilaterally, regionally, 70-75% have labour clauses in them, and the vast majority of those refer to the 1998 Declaration. I hope you'll have a chance to look at Chapter 23 of the, the new NAFTA, if that's what it's called, uh, the Mexico-Canada-US Trade Agreement. Chapter 23, we're all over that. We're all over that. Uh, I heard the, uh, the Minister of, of Canada saying, Canada today will only negotiate quality trade agreements. Quality trade agreements. When he said that, he meant labour standards, and he meant environmental standards too. That's the way the negotiation of trade is going, and that's where we've gone. Yeah, the right to strike, I'm being too long, sorry. The right to strike, yeah. Uh, you know, what happened, and it happened just after I got elected, which led me to get marginally paranoid about life. Uh, the employers came back with this um, actually sleeping argument, because it's been there for a while, that Convention 87, the Freedom uh, to Organize Convention of the ILO, the most fundamental of all conventions of the ILO, negotiated in 1948, adopted in 1948, uh, they, the employers came back with the argument that since that convention, which again fits very comfortably on one side of the paper, does not explicitly mention, and it's true that it does not, the right to strike, then that convention should not be taken uh, to be understood to recognize the existence of a right to strike in international law. Uh, the fact that the ILO's committee of experts had for half a century up until that point interpreted, understood that convention to contain a right to strike, and there is very, very considerable body of jurisprudence to that effect, um, didn't seem to convince the employers. So they came back a little late in the day and said, sorry, where Convention 87 talks about the right of trade unions and employers' organizations to organize their activities in full freedom, it is a mistake to believe that that includes recognition of a right to strike. And we had a, a battle royale around that, which your right to say is not resolved. I think that is a fair comment to make. Um, the work of the ILO's key conference committee on the application of standards was disrupted. It couldn't complete its work, if my memory is correct, in two successive years, 2012, 2013. This was leading to a genuine crisis in the organization. And frankly, we have concocted um, a tripartite agreement to disagree. Both employers and workers have, have taken their positions and we found a way to keep our supervisory machinery moving on without really resolving the legal issue at stake. What I find encouraging about all of this is that whilst employers and workers are really at loggerheads on this issue, what I thought would happen has not happened. That is to say that governments, many of those who one might a priori believe would have an interest in perhaps weakening ILO jurisprudence on the right to strike, have not done so. The temptation to, to sort of use this to sort of roll back long-established labor rights in a key area, that temptation has not been ceded to. So not the United States, not China, not Iran, nobody. And I often wonder why that is the case. And I think it has something to do with a certain international interest in preserving the integrity of the ILO supervisory system. There is a resistance to opportunism in that regard. And I think we're very fortunate, uh, but I also think it says that there is value to our supervisory system, which one might not see at first glance, and that the international community recognizes that and is anxious, even in these difficult times of multilateralism, uh, to protect the ILO's authority in this area. We will turn uh, soon to the students, but let me ask you uh, one uh, of the other big questions that comes up. Some folks think that the 1919 industrial or corporate organization around unions, employers, and states, uh, especially when you think of states as talking to labor ministries, unions talking to one uh, AFL-CIO uh, representative from each country, and one, say, business roundtable from each country is outdated. Uh, most of the planet is not in labor unions. Uh, much of the planet is mobile and transient, so it's not even clear that one state uh, has domination. Many of them are in global supply chains where the most powerful actor is the top corporation in that chain. And the ILO 
has stayed away for the most part from working directly with companies. So is the, but yet the organization still affirms tripartite uh, system is at the core of everything that it does. That's how it's constituted. Uh, so how do you answer uh, the, the changing world of work challenge? I think there's a lot of questions bundled up in that, uh, yes. uh, that question. Uh, <laughs> but I'll start with, I think, the one which you really want to prod me on, uh, and that is, you know, is it legitimate in 2019, 100 years on, uh, for the organization which negotiates and supervises international labor standards, the rules of the game for the global labor economy, uh, is it legitimate that that job is done not just by governments, but by um, workers and employers' representatives in an era, and let me be quite straightforward in agreeing with you on that, Professor, of declining representative legitimacy of those, those organizations. And that's not, I, the first thing to say is I think it's a question that needs to be asked and need to be answered. It's not, uh, how can I put it, it's not just a, a hostile or a facile sort of uh, attack on the organization. My answer, however, is, is, is very clear. Um, I absolutely believe that the model remains uh, contemporary, important, and uh, the model remains legitimate. Um, it's true that we have seen this decline in representativeness on actually not only on the workers' side, but also on the, uh, on the side of, of, of employers, basically because many employers don't see the need, I think, uh, to federate, to get involved in employers' organizations. Mm -hmm. You don't tend to see the Amazons, the Googles, the Microsoft of this world uh, uh, signing up to, to employers, federations, and the like. And yet, there is something about uh, the role of, or the nature of the world of work, the need for interest representation and countervailing forces which correct the inherent asymmetry of the working relationship. There's something going back to basic principles. There is an inherent asymmetry in working life between you know, uh, the man or the woman who accepts an employment contract and the employer of that person. And I don't see anything in the world of work today which means that asymmetry has disappeared. It might even have got, I suspect, uh, rather more acute than it used to be. So you need collective representation of interests at work. Of that, I have no doubt. And in those countries where collective representation of interest is most efficient and strongest, not only do you get more equitable outcomes at work, you actually get better economic performance. You look at the performance indices around the world. You look at the productivity indices, the sort of stuff that the World Economic Forum and others put out. There they are at the top of the list, the Germanys, the Swedens, and always. This stuff makes sense. So I do believe in the value of the need for collective interest representation. And going back to the beginning of what I said, the common interest gains. I call this, a, a, you know, this is a, a public good. Effective collective representation of interest and mechanisms to bring together in dialogue processes those contending interest representations, I see as a public good in society. I think we've lost sight of that, but I think it is still the case. Now, that does not lead me to just dismiss the notion that you know, diminishing representative is not an issue. It truly is. What I'm encouraged by is in the ILO at least, organized labor, but also organized employers, take seriously the need to be interested in and to work uh, in the interests of those who are not organized. One of the biggest boom areas uh, in the ILO's work in recent years has been our work on the informal economy around the world. That's 61% of the global workforce, so the question you put is absolutely right. But we are trying, and it's become, a, I think, a major item of national policies in many parts of the world, to seek roads of formalization of the informal economy, which opens doors towards a more structured representation of interests that we're talking about. The other angle, and I'll stop on this, is does not the appearance of global supply chains, value chains, the multinational reach of business, in some way weaken or vitiate the ILO's model, which is very much based on the nation state, is very much based on national acceptance of legal obligations.
and their supervision in the ILO. And that's been a big issue. One of the first things I did when I, I came in at the ILO was to launch what I called an enterprise initiative at the ILO. That is to say we need to work directly with enterprises as well as with employers' organizations, and the difference is extremely important. Part of what was in my mind is we had to follow the value chains. We couldn't simply work country by country. We had to work transversely, cross-frontier, around the value chains. And then something happened, as things sometimes happen in history, that gave real impetus to this, uh, this initiative, and that was, I don't know how far we are from the Triangle uh, Shirtwaist factory that burnt down there. About four blocks. Yeah. So what that did in 1911 with a loss, I think, of 146 lives. Uh, Rana Plaza in Bangladesh with a loss of over 1,100 lives did. Here was a factory that was supplying the retailers who I'm sure you'll find in the streets around here, uh, in, in ready-made garment industry, uh, which basically was having people work and supply the shops around here, uh, people working in a death trap. I mean, it was subsequently you know, seen and found to be a death trap. Been audited, got a lot of the tick, tick, ticks around the social auditing. It was a death trap. And that led, I think, to an extraordinary... As, 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 as the Triangle Fire did in the United States, in New York State, and then in the United States. An extraordinary change in at least the ILO's attitude and behavior around global supply chains. In the immediate case of Bangladesh, we had an extraordinary, and I, I suspect it's in the news right now, um, engagement of, 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 of retailers uh, and organized labor uh, to put together this accord which has been working in Bangladesh in the last five or six years, and I think done extraordinarily good work about not only assuring much higher standards of safety and health in the Bangladesh ready-made garment industry, but much else as well. It's unfinished business, and I just get, I really hope that the Accord will get the chance to finish its business in Bangladesh. But the point I'm trying to make is this helped us not, not to move from the nation-state approach, national jurisdictions, simply to the supply chain, but to basically triangulate around both of them uh, and, and do what I think is much more appropriate and much more effective in the current circumstances of the global labor market. The, uh, the achievements of the Accord on Fire and Building Safety in Bangladesh, it has its own website and it tells you all about the, the number of, of retailers and others who are involved. So now it's your turn. Questions, will be sure uh, once you're called on to press. Thank you. My name is Ngozi Wanta. Um, so you, you mentioned something about the informal economy. Now, I don't know, but the definition of informal economy that the ILO um, adopts for me, I, I would describe it as restrictive because it says the informal economy um, comprises of all activities in the informal sector and informal activities in the formal sector. But what of situations, what, what of, why sh can, can we look at informal economy as not just um, encompassing the illegal activities because when you come to some of the developing economies, right, you find out that the informal sector is actually vibrant. And in situations of small businesses, I mean, most of the activities in the informal sector actually run, um, run the economy in some ways and actually helps people at the grassroots level. So I would wonder, I w I would wonder how the ILO tries to protect, instead of encouraging a total transition from the informal economy to the formal economy, what of a situation where the ILO acknowledges the existence of these informal, um, informal economies, informal activities in the informal sector, which are not by themselves illegal, but are not regulated by the state, right? So if the ILO um, recognizes the existence of these informal um, sectors as contributing actively to the GDP and the growth of a particular state, and then tries to come up with sort of like 
guidelines or regulations on how labor activities can go on in that informal economy. Or maybe adopt something like braiding, like maybe formal, formal activities um, that can be linked to informal, um, informal economy to actually grow these informal economies that are not by themselves illegal. So I would want to know what you think about this proposition of mine. Yeah, it's a, <coughs> it was and, and continues to be a major debate. I mean, if we were probably having this exchange 20 years ago, I, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure if I'm quite on the right time scale, we would be talking about an extensive literature. Hernando Soto would be, I think, the major protagonist who would be arguing that the informal sector is in fact, the informal economy, informal sector is in fact an incubator of entrepreneurial dynamism and to be encouraged. That was yesterday's news, at least in the ILO. I think it has been a development uh, theory has suggested that is not the case. That in fact, whilst the informal economy does occupy a very important part of economic activity in many countries, certainly provides a, a livelihood for many workers, and the ILO has never denied that reality. We would be very foolish to do so. Nevertheless, this uh, notion that informality is actually sort of developmental friendly and developmental positive has given way in the ILO, and this is a conscious political consensus uh, to which not only trade unions uh, and governments are party, but employers too, that the most helpful road forward is that of formalization. And we adopted a recommendation, a non-binding advisory instrument, a number of years ago, which is entirely about the formalization of the informal economy. This is the road that governments, employers, and workers have encouraged the ILO to follow. Now, I don't think it's about, you've raised the definitional question, which I think is somewhat to the side of this. It's relevant, but not the main point. Uh, the question then is, how do we interact with those engaged in the informal economy. I mean, it's not, about, about, it's not about illegality. I agree with that absolutely. I think that what the ILO tries to do and what governments, I think, are doing uh, is to work with those in the informal economy, not because you want to uh, make them illegal or to end their activities, but to find pathways for them to enter the formal economy. And that, of course, involves many things. On the workers' side, it involves promotion of um, uh, organizations of informal workers, of which there are many examples. Uh, on the economic side, it talks about effective administration. It talks about um, appropriate social security and taxation systems. It talks about access to finance. And you will find today many countries, I think Latin America is a very good example, where formalization of the informal economy and in Latin America, you're just over 50% uh, uh, in formality rates, where this has become a central tenet of uh, not just government labor policy, but of developmental policy. Now, I'm fully aware, and I've you know, had many uh, exchanges in this regard, that there are contrary points of view about the right way to deal with informality. But this is a road uh, which the ILO, not by a decision of someone like me, but by decision of our member states, uh, that's a road we've chosen to pursue. Hi, I'm a visitor from the National University of Singapore. Um, so my question is basically, one of the main criticisms of um, globalization has been that although there is economic growth, we have winners, we have losers. The losers, obviously, um, the workers that have lost their jobs uh, to other countries. I was wondering whether the ILO has, sees itself as having any role in addressing the needs of those workers of, of this gap. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm, certainly it's, it's a debate which has greatly occupied the ILO um, from the 1990s. Um, we, we've just actually uh, you know, completed the work of a global commission on the future of work, but there's one precedent uh, to that uh, global commission, which is a global commission uh, that reported, I think, some 15 years ago about, 15 years ago about the, global dimension, uh, the social dimension of globalization, which 
look very much at the issues uh, that you have raised. Not only does the ILO certainly have a, a role in respect of workers who are perhaps on the losing side of the balance sheet of globalization, I think one of the criticisms aimed at the ILO is that we are perhaps overly focused on that category of the workforce precisely because they are those where organized labor has high levels of representation. And I, I do you know, uh, often hear people saying, you know, you really should look beyond U.S. steel workers and look at the informal workers in uh, South Asia or Africa and that the balance of attention is in fact in the wrong place. Look, I think there, there, there are, there, there's a few things to say about this. Well, there, there's a whole sort of day's conversation to have about this. I don't know how you feel it in the United States, but the politics of today in North America uh, in Europe, at least, I can speak with, with some confidence, is, you know, the politics we're living through is intimately linked to the question you've just put. Uh, you know, there was a time when the, um, the attack on globalization or the anti-globalization movement, think back to the Porto Alegre World Social Forum uh, movements, this was coming from, I would say, you know, a pretty uh, civil society, fairly left sort of critique of globalization. Something weird has happened today. It's not coming from there any longer. The critique of globalization is coming from a different part of our politics. And I've pondered the reasons of how that extraordinary swing of the pendulum has taken place. And I'm not sure that I've really worked it out. But you know, there are, I think, some parts of our societies, some sectors of societies, I really hate the notion of the losers as, as a concept. It's what Roosevelt called the forgotten, well, he said the forgotten man. But it's about those who feel they've, they've, they've lost out. The old World Social Forum anti-globalization movement was a very um, uncomfortable uh, amalgam of traditional organized labor and radical civil society. Um, you know, the Battle of Seattle was, was the, the, the pinnacle of that moment. As somebody told me it's when uh, uh, the steel workers met body piercing. It was an interesting experience with a whiff of tear gas in the air. We've now gone to something quite different. Something quite different. And what that encourages me to think in terms of the ILO is that we have to, we have to get hold of this agenda because this is a where the tensions in our societies, maybe this is a somewhat industrial north sort of jaundiced view, but this is where the tensions in our societies originate, and this is precisely the types of issues that the ILO was established 100 years ago to address. Now, you know, history is a weird thing. It brings you the same issues back in, in different guises, but I do believe uh, that we have a lot. Uh, I'm gonna leave the issue hanging rather in the air but I do believe a lot's at stake in this debate, and the ILO is fundamentally uh, has fundamental responsibilities in trying to address it. I guess in Singapore it's seen a wee bit differently, however. <laughs> Sorry, um, I, I think I'd give the Director General a choice, um, so I'll pose several questions. Uh, one would just be to follow up on his um, comments earlier about the ILO's approach to uh, formality, informality, uh, and you seem to suggest that it's the um, governing body, the, the uh, executive board and so on, that is pushing that particular approach. But <clears throat> it seems to be, uh, at least in the developed world, very much at odds with the way in which employment trends are moving. Uh, and I'm wondering if that doesn't leave the ILO out on something of a limb as we get the gig economy picking up and a determined move towards uh, informal employment arrangements. Second question would be what do you think of the World Bank's uh, major analysis, World Development Report on the Future of Work, which seems to go in very different directions from the ILO's own recent global Commission report. Uh, 
Uh, and the third, if, if you mentioned UBI before, uh, universal basic income, the question is, is there any way in which UBI could be seen as a constructive contribution to the future of work debate from the ILO perspective? Yeah, and I'll take them in reverse order if, I, if, if, if Professor Elston will allow me. Universal basic income. Uh, I'm radically, I'm much more radical than my organization. I'm radically against uh, universal basic income. It's got me into some scrapes with the likes of Andy Stern uh, uh, and others in this regard. But I have to be very clear about what I'm saying in all of this. Universal basic income I understand to be and I heard it uh, presented on the TV this morning by, by the presidential candidate, as a citizen's income, you know, that $1,000 or whatever it's to be, entirely independently, uh, entirely independent of your employment status, if any, and your other areas of income or revenues. It's just something you get, whatever. And I heard it justified on the TV this morning, and this is what disturbs me the most, um, by this presidential candidate saying, hey, you know, uh, there's, there, there is a, an employment apocalypse out there right now. Artificial intelligence is going to absolutely hoover up jobs, particularly at the lower end of the labor market. The platform economy means that we will no longer be able to rely on a reliable, predictable flow of income to sustain a decent life. So you just have to have a universal basic income because the world of work isn't going to be able to sustain us any longer. That discourse scares the hell out of me because for me it is equivalent to giving up on work. It's saying we are incapable of organizing, regulating our world of work so that it can do what we spent a hundred years trying to get it to do, which is to provide a basis for a decent and acceptable standard of living and the sort of social arrangements that we want to see in our society. So my fundamental objection, my fundamental objection to UBI is the giving up on work. I think it's an abdication of a basic policy responsibility. Those of my friends of a more economistic frame of mind think that UBI is not feasible because it's simply too heavy a fiscal burden. It is a very poor uh, use of resources. In many cases, it's seen as being very highly regressive uh, in terms of its impact. Uh, so there are many arguments against it. On the other hand, and this is where I think the conversation tends to get somewhat blurred, I'm very, very much in favor of, and it's part of the ILO's um, platform right now, of establishing much more effective and comprehensive social protection systems. But that's a different proposition in my mind, and we shouldn't confuse the two points. So that's me and, and, and UBI. By the way, our Global Commission had a fairly extensive discussion about universal basic income, uh, and they simply put it aside. They didn't want to make uh, a down-the-line negative statement about it, but they did not include it uh, in, in, in their, at least, recommendations on the future of work. On the World Bank report on the future of work, we read it, and we made a public statement about it. And the public statement, uh, much to the, I think, annoyance of Jim Kim at the time, it's not complimentary. That's in the public domain, so you might want to look at it. Um, you, you're quite right, uh, Professor Alston. Uh, that World Bank report on the future of work uh, stands in somewhat stark contrast to the types of line that our own report uh, is taking. And I think each will have to stand on their merits and stand on the reaction that they get. I think the World Bank report was in many ways a rather traditional report. Uh, some of the people who, who wrote it, I think, uh, uh, have done other work in the World Bank around doing business, for example, which made the outcome of that report somewhat predictable. But it's true to say, and I won't deny it, uh, that the ILO uh, take on future of work differs very substantially from the one set out in that uh, World Bank report. Now, informality, the gig economy, etc. I don't follow, I think, quite the line of reasoning. Informality, and I go back to the previous questioner, is the absence of regulation. It's work that takes place beyond the regulatory reach of the state. The diversification of work forms a platform economy, that's not, that's not what's happening. It may be that our institutions are badly adapted uh, to the appearance of these new work forms, but I would not describe Uber 
or Deliveroo or those forms of employment as being uh, informal. They might be precarious, they might be nasty, they might be substandard, but I don't think they're informal in the sense of the previous conversation that we've had about informality. But, of course, they raise enormous challenges. I mean, I'd be, the whole conversation about the platform, the gig economy, is a very important one. At least some people think so. Um, some people, and the jury is out on this, would see the emerging platform economy as a precursor today of something that will be quite generalized in the future. Others see it as a niche that will remain a niche, and they don't buy into the notion that today's platform economy is where we'll all be working in the future. But regardless of that, let's accept that there is a diversification of work forms growing in our um, labor markets. That the old standard employment relationship, full-time, open-ended contract, pension attached, all the rest of it, health benefits in the States, Let's, I mean, let's imagine that that is on the decline and other forms of working are on the increase, and that's pretty much the trend around the world. The question is, what do we do about that? And there are two arguments, I think, or two lines being heard in the ILO. I think organized labor would like to reinstate the standard employment form as the norm or maintain it where it's still around. I liken this a little bit to putting the genie back into the bottle. It's not an easy thing to do. But that is one line of reasoning. The other is to say, okay, diversification of working arrangements is going to be with us and it's probably going to grow in the future. But we have to reorganize our institutions of work to make sure that those who work in whatever form of contractual arrangement are able to benefit from equivalent protections at work as to those in the standard uh, employment form. And the fact of the matter is today, if you're not in the standard employment form, there are clearly penalties that you pay. You get paid less if you're a part-time or a temporary worker. You get paid less. You get less social protection and pension benefits. You certainly get less holiday benefits. Uh, there's a whole series of areas in which there is a penalty involved. Now, if you were able to put in place working uh, labor market arrangements which eliminated that penalty, then you might find ways of regulating a more diversified uh, labor market than the one we have today without the negatives um, uh, that, that might otherwise um, result from it. And that's why uh, the Global Commission of the ILO on the Future of Work has recommended a universal labor guarantee in one of its recommendations, a bundle of protections that should be available to all workers regardless of their employment status or contractual arrangements. And the interesting thing about that bundle is that it, um, it's a bundle of issues which is already contemplated in the ILO's 1919 constitution. It talks about maximum uh, working time arrangements. It talks again about an adequate living wage. It talks about health and safety. It talks about social protection. So in a sense, it's the ILO going back to its sources and trying to apply it to this new and diversified and complex set of um, employment arrangements that we're seeing more and more present. Thank you very much, and we have run out of time. I think you can see why we invited uh, Mr. Ryder, and I hope you will help us thank him.